Well, Robert Egger, thank you so much for coming to Valparaiso University, for being so generous with your time and your wisdom while you're here today. Honored, 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 honored. One of the things that we like to do with all of our speakers is obviously you're going to have the opportunity later today to talk about the work of LA Kitchen, but we think it's really important for students, both who are here right now and students who might be watching this next semester or in later years, to get a sense of how you got from you know the start of this work to where you are now. Because I think far too often a lot of our undergraduates in particular think like, well, if I don't have it figured out right. immediately, then I'll never get where I want to go. So we think that this kind of story is actually really important, giving them a sense of what's possible. Well, me too. Because I mean, you oftentimes think it just happens right. versus what I like to call relentless incrementalism. You right. know, this, this, this constant sense of stronger, faster, better, stronger, faster, better, but it's the sum of many parts, not some giant big thing that just happens. Yeah, so the place that I'd like to start actually is I don't think there are many presidents of nonprofits who have like School of Life on their LinkedIn pages. Um, and so I'd like for you to talk a little bit about kind of formal education versus informal education and the different experiences that you feel have really kind of prepared you and kind of helped you do this kind of work and the ways that you were able to kind of find information and training and mentors who kind of helped give you deeper knowledge in the different things that you found were necessary to run first DC Central Kitchen well and then in all the work that's kind of come since. Wow. Um, well, you know, I didn't go to college, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm a big believer in lifelong learning mm -hmm. and I'm intensely curious, you know, why, why. It's almost like that kid who's like, why, why, you know, mm -hmm. it's like the same thing. It's like constantly asking, well, why do we do it that way? And mm -hmm. is there another way to do it? And why haven't we? And what mm -hmm. are the barriers? So there's that. It's enough, you know, no matter what gig you're in, but in particular with like when you do human service work, which is, mm -hmm. it can take its toll. Yeah. You need private time. You need a, a, a process that you go through. Right. Now, I was a runner for many years, and then I became a walker. Mm -hmm. But in hindsight, I realized that for a large part of my life, I've needed reflective time. I've needed, when I was a kid, I went to church. Mm -hmm. You know, but there was always that sense of a weekly basis, maybe in a church situation. And funny, now again, it was just my personal thing, but at a certain age, I became less interested in the formal church environment and how could I create my own process. Mm -hmm. So running became my church in a weird way. Mm -hmm. Like I was looking at the clouds. I don't know if you're there in frame here, but there's beautiful Midwest clouds and just the idea of being able to walk mm -hmm. and not only just see the world in the here and now and start right. to really start to appreciate the right here, right now of it, right. but the process to think things through. Mm -hmm. you know. Um, as a young man, again, I don't want to do the faith thing too much, but I was intrigued by the church I was raised in, and I ended, ended up in an Episcopal church. Mm -hmm. And at one point they'd say, forgive me for what I said, but what I left unsaid, for what I did, but what I didn't do. Mm -hmm. And that was new to me. I always had mm -hmm. to say, here's what I did wrong, and right. please forgive me, versus could I have done it differently? And that right. that idea of trying to let go mm -hmm. of, because it's easy in a world when somebody doesn't do what you want or you think they should do, to become angry at them. And that can really poison you, you know? So that idea of how do I let it go? You know, how do I recognize that they're just we're all flawed humans trying to find our way? Mm -hmm. But how do I, in my own personal business, forgive, forget, move on, and 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 learn? You right. Know? So, to a certain extent, there's always been a self of self mentoring, you know. Mm -hmm. But then I've always sought out, and sometimes really, uh, you know, squeezed like sponges, older people who had knowledge that I desperately wanted. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, one of the things that's interesting is. I was saying, nobody wakes up when they're 20 and says, you know, when I grow up, I'm going to be a boring bureaucrat that stifles innovation. And interestingly enough, some of the people when I was younger who were my mentors, as, as we each got older, they changed. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I changed, but mm -hmm. I started to see in them flaws that I didn't see when I was young. And I saw them as all-knowing, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to both respect them, you know, that's their journey, this is mine. But also on a personal level, how can I avoid that trap of becoming boring or becoming protective or trying to own things or control things. Mm -hmm. So that idea of not only, you know, how did I find my own mentors, but how do I be a mentor? You know, right. and how can I, at least in my journey, try and overtly display right. a commitment to that sense of I, I I don't want to be rigid, I don't want to be boring. I, I always want to try and remain open. Right. And how do you do that? Well, one of the things that is really interesting is, you know, obviously lots of people spend a lot of money getting degrees in things like nonprofit management, or um, even today, you know, we met a professor who's teaching a class on like agriculture and social justice. And you have people who spend a lot of time feeling like, well, I, I have to take this class and I have to get this degree. And it seems like, you know, kind of coming into this story that you had to become an expert in things like 
food policy and social work and all of these things that weren't kind of part of any kind of like formal plan. And so, you know, how do you think, what is the value of developing expertise kind of as you're going and how do you feel like that kind of freed you up to be able to see a different way of doing things? And how would you kind of talk to students today about both being prepared but also leaving that room to kind of learn as they go? Well, I think for many people, and you you know, I think in, in the interesting book, Fight Club, mm -hmm. you know, it's a sense of they told me to do this, this, and this, and I'd be happy. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm fascinated by older Americans now because many people, you know, 10,000 people a day wake up 70, and I have to think a lot of them are looking in the mirror saying, how did I get so lost? Mm -hmm. They told me I'd be happy if I had all this stuff, and yeah, right. I mean, it's bought me happiness, but I don't feel fulfilled. There's something missing right. in my life, and I'm fascinated by right. that. So, there always has been a little bit of a nonconformist streak in me. And of course, I'm very much a child of my era. I was 10 in 1968. So as a kid looking, whether it was Gloria Steinem, James Brown, you mm -hmm. know, Bobby Seals, I mean, the world was surrounded by people who said, what we're doing now isn't good enough. So right. there was always a sense of, that's the, that's the, the, the right. team I want to be on. Right. But it's funny, as a young man, I want to open a nightclub. Mm -hmm. And so... Even though I didn't go to college, I approached running nightclubs the same way. I had to take classes, and some right. I did not like. Mm -hmm. But I knew I had to understand and learn these things to be a night to do what I wanted to do, which right. was put on shows. You know, right. so I was, and I've never been a good student. You know, and it's very difficult for me to learn in a very traditional way. But that, it's 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 what makes you curious. For me now, now I love what I do because I'm intensely curious. I want to. I think I found that 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 road, mm -hmm. but. It was not what I mean. Again, I ran nightclubs, and, and my, literally from age thirteen to twenty-nine, mm -hmm. all I wanted to do was open a nightclub. Right. And suddenly, without any warning whatsoever, the road split, mm -hmm. and it was like, wait, it was supposed to be this way, and right. suddenly, and there's no signpost. Right. You know, polka dots and moonbeams this way. I turn back if I were you. Right. It was that leap of faith moment right. where there was a sense of, wow, I didn't expect it. I couldn't have planned it, but maybe this is the path right. I'm supposed to be on. Well, so this I find fascinating. So in kind of going through your story, you know, you talk about kind of having this volunteer experience um, with the gate patrol and kind of and how that kind of set you on this idea of like, well, could we be doing something different in terms of how we approach kind of feeding the hungry and that whole model? At the same time, you had a business plan for yeah. your own nightclub kind yeah. of ready to go. When you first kind of started pursuing this idea of the central kitchen, did you think that it would be temporary and that you'd end up kind of coming back to nightclubs? Or as soon as you kind of went that way, did it feel like, well, this is what I'm doing now? Or like, whatever happened to the other business plan and how did you kind of have the discernment to decide I'm doing this other thing? Well, it's such an interesting thing because as you suggested, after a volunteer experience, I decided, you know, I know they mean well, but right. there's, a, there's a more practical and right. more business way to approach this. Right. And I was rebuffed. I went to all these different charities saying, here, take it. Mm -hmm. And they were like, nope, nope, nope. So it's like, it's not as hard as they think. I'll get it started and push it off and go back. Mm -hmm. And for probably, literally, it's it's laughable, but I probably spent 10 years saying to people, look, you know, my real dream is someday I'm going to open the greatest nightclub in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there was a good story to that. You know, it, it was a good fundraising pitch because everyone would then want to know, how'd you go from wanting nightclubs to doing this? Right. But what was fascinating is it seems like all the prep work I did to open a nightclub, I could A, apply to this business. Because right. it wasn't just another food service business, to be right. quite honest with you. Right. But interestingly enough, it wasn't the back of the house knowledge of food waste or how to use food or train people. It was the theater of food that became the most powerful thing for me because everything I wanted to do with music, my idea of running a nightclub wasn't booking bands and selling liquor, it was putting on shows mm -hmm. that would disguise social justice as entertainment. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always became mystified. Uh, as I grew older, you saw Oprah use afternoon entertainment as this safe kind of, this is this entertainment. It's not, I'm not trying to get your soul, right. which is what she was after. Right. And similarly, John, see what John Stewart got an entire generation interested in politics by making it funny right. or absurd. Right. So that's what I wanted to do, use theater and music to get social justice issues that I think were powerful, mm -hmm. keeping going forward. But then I discovered, interesting enough, food and music have the exact same principles. You know, they draw people in. And so, interesting enough, a lot of people don't know this, but everything I did in, in the DC Central Kitchen, it was like a nightclub. Mm -hmm. It was a nightclub with food instead of music. Mm -hmm. But everything I wanted to accomplish 
what I decided was instead of the idea of you're going to come in and see a show with music, I just created a show with food and felons mm -hmm. and community. Mm -hmm. But it was designed to get people, just as I wanted to do with a nightclub, I wanted people to come in, sit down, experience something and leave different. Mm -hmm. Even if they didn't know, but I had subtly manipulated, for lack of a better word, their 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 sense of place. You right. know? And if I could do that in a, night, in, in a nightclub, why not in a nonprofit? Right. So I've approached it the same ever since. Excellent. Now, one of the things that I think is really interesting is you talk a lot about how nonprofits view one another, and that there is this idea of like if we're competing with other nonprofits, that we're kind of doing it wrong, right? And so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about kind of finding that space between like. I'm going to start a nonprofit, and it's worth it because I'm going to do it. Versus like finding ways to kind of plug in with institutions that currently exist and being able to bring your specific insight or skill set or different way of viewing the world to that vis-a-vis -vis just starting your own thing. Right. Well, again, it's really important to realize I started a nonprofit because the groups I went to wouldn't change. Right. So, on a personal level, how could I? avoid at all costs becoming that person. Mm -hmm. And so within the LA Kitchen now, we actually incubate smaller nonprofits. Cool. So we use our space. It's like, you're young, you don't have a space, use ours. Right. You know? um, but at the same time, understanding that there is the rigidity of thinking that sadly permeates our sector. But to a sense, we're, we're not financed to be innovative. You right. know? So to a certain extent, we're supposed to fight each other. It's, mm -hmm. it's, in fact, when you, when you study independence movies, uh, movements, 99% of the time, it's a liberator just says to people who've been divided, wait, wait, time out. We're not the enemies. Our enemies over there. Right. And so nonprofits just haven't got to that stage yet. Now, mm -hmm. that's, that's frustrating for me. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to um, find that Rosa Parks moment, mm -hmm. that moment when nonprofits say, whoa, 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 time out. Let's do it differently. Right. And it's been difficult um, because there is, a, there is a nonprofit Hunger Games. If you look at that movie, yeah. it would be very easy for everyone to say, why are we fighting each other? We should turn our attention to these people who are making us fight. Right. Yet that's not the way the book or life works sometimes. Right. So it can be very difficult to be that person saying, let's not fight when you're the first person they'll kill. Yeah. You know? yeah. So sometimes most people think it's a sucker's bet to care and I'll just do what I've done. There's very few, I, I really don't think, in my experience, there's very few young people who started a nonprofit who haven't tried mm -hmm. to partner or find someone else to help them. And nine times out of ten, they do it because the people they go to, their generational elders, won't embrace them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm fixated on that. Now, this is not something that is the nonprofit sector. Business, everywhere you go, right. it's the same, for all intents and purposes, very similar. Right. So I think for younger people in particular at this stage, and assuming that's who's in the audience, it's that sense of really deciding at a young age, what kind of, what kind of adult do you want to be? Mm -hmm. Like I said, no one wakes up when they're 20 saying, I'm going to be old and boring. Right. So the question becomes, okay, if that's not what you want to become, what's your path? How do you set, it might not be, let's say it this way, you might not know your chosen path, but you can get a sense of what's your compass needle. Mm -hmm. What's going to point me in the right direction so that I don't become that person, I, you know, that, I, that, that, that beast metaphorically I set out to slay. Yeah. And that's something that's lifelong. I still, to this day, constantly try and self-analyze. And also surround myself by young people and even volunteers who I try mm -hmm. to empower to speak truth to me. Right. You know, I want people to say, dude, you're being a jerk. Right. And, and sadly, it works. Right. You know, right. sometimes. It's very hard to hear. Yeah. Like I have every year I get reviewed anonymously by our staff. And it's one thing if somebody, you know, but to have anonymous, you know, typed things, so I don't know who wrote it. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult because people then feel liberated to say you know, what they really think. Yeah. And that's sometimes hard medicine, but it's the medicine that I think is the is probably the most likely way for me to stay the person I, I dreamed I'd be when I was younger. Yeah. Well, so this actually is a nice transition into talking about leadership. Because obviously, you know, there's, there's the service part that we at the Institute for Leadership and Service talk about. But there is also, I think figuring out what it means to be a good leader at a time when a lot of different people want to lay claim to what a good leader looks like. And one part of your story that I found really interesting is when you kind of stepped in to take over as um, the director of United Way in DC and that there had basically been kind of like a failure of leadership. Um, and you know, you talk about somebody kind of telling you that, well, you need to buy more suits and you like, because this, this is what, right, a, leader this is what a leader looks like. And so I'm curious, you know, 
in both in terms of your experience and stepping in to that type of leadership situation with having people who wanted you to be this way versus kind of your own internal sense of what the right way to kind of reorient the organization was following this kind of leadership vacuum um, and just you know kind of over your tenure in nonprofits kind of who have been the most effective leaders and what do you feel are kind of these are the things that we should really be thinking about in terms of good leadership versus what we've been told is good leadership. Well, you know, it's funny, oftentimes when somebody's not buying your product, mm -hmm. you always, you never blame the customer. In business, in theory, you don't blame the customer, you look at the product. Mm -hmm. And that's always fascinating to me. You know, sometimes if nobody's following you, look in the mirror, you right. know. So I'm always intrigued by, you know, that idea of, you know, leadership is, is a fascinating subject. Like, for example, many times in my career, I've not been the highest paid employee. And that's very confusing for people. And actually, that's part of the point is, you know, A, my circumstances did not mandate that I'd be the highest paid employee. You know, my wife and I chose to have one child. Mm -hmm. And when she moved, it's just the two of us. I have people who have two, three children and are just mm -hmm. starting out in life. Why shouldn't they make more their time sick? So, um, and my, my leadership isn't derived by my paycheck. Mm -hmm. But it, it also, at the same time, so I didn't need it, but it proved to be a powerful tool to get people to stop and ponder, wow, I've just never heard of it that way. So sometimes it's fun to mess with people and try and throw them curveballs purposely to get them to re-examine what it looks like. But going back to the idea of a suit and tie, I mean, when I took over the United Way, it wasn't my bag to wear a suit and tie to begin with. In fact, I've worn this outfit, for literally this outfit, um, for, I mean, I've had this pair of boots. Or, These are or, blue. I'm very disappointed. Oh, well, I, did, I did have blue for a while, but I started wearing suede boots, and I've had this style, literally. I bought, bought five pairs of this boot and these jeans and a black shirt and a black, I've worn this forever. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, my point was that the consumer was distrustful of suits. Mm -hmm. You know, they felt like these, that, that was just somebody, another suited nonprofit person right. whose salary was derived from this. That their motivation right. wasn't, how do I spend your money more effectively? It was, right. how do I keep a job for myself? Right. And I knew that the only way to give those, those people who, the other way needed their money Mm -hmm. was to give them the opposite of what they were used to, is to, is to in effect introduce a different salesperson. That's what they really needed was a different salesperson. And it was fascinating to go in and try and get a group of people who were justifiably mad to stop and think. And not just, and let's go back to this idea of leadership. I could have said, give the United Way and here's why. Mm -hmm. But what I was trying to do is say, in effect, you like, you're listening to me now only because I ran the DC Central Kitchen and I stepped in. Mm -hmm. And you have a momentary bit of respect for me for doing this. So. I'm just here to try and meet you and figure out how we're going to move forward. But you like what I did at the kitchen, right? I started, you know my story, I started, went out and volunteered and I created a system that got food that was donated, trained people for jobs, got people jobs. You like that, right? And they're like, yeah, right? And I'd say, okay, now I want you to really understand. I know most of you all think, why should I give a dollar to the United Way when they're going to take a little bit of money out of it, when I can just give my money directly to a charity? Literally, 99% would raise their hand. Sure. And they'd raise it with kind of one of those... What do you got to say about that? Yeah. And it's like, well, look, if you like what I do, you got to realize that the only way I could evolve from handing out cups of soup night after night to doing what I do is I'm a business. And the United Way, whether you like it or not, I get a check. I'm a, I'm a nonprofit person who grew my business because they'd send me a check once a month. I knew it was coming. I could plan. I could budget. I could be strategic. And there's a difference between going out to the mailbox with your fingers crossed, hoping somebody sent a check, and running a business. So right. let's sober up and let's rebuild and do this together. But it was trying to get them to see philanthropy isn't just the United Way's version of it. Right. It was this idea of the nickels and dimes add up. You know, I would say no, we were doing 5,000 meals a day, and it wasn't because one restaurant called up. It was the same, actually, interesting principle. So a lot of the ways I've tried to use my business, and even speaking about my business, is not telling people what I do. Mm -hmm. It's what it represents. You know, right. In other words, I would say, look, we can do 5,000 meals because dozens of restaurants don't want to throw away food, and they've chosen to embrace a little bit of extra work to partner with us, and they all donate little bits that come that can become part of a greater whole, right. and ultimately we can achieve these much greater things. So right. it's a, it's I, I really do trade, as I think you can tell in metaphors, mm -hmm. but metaphors you can see and touch because mm -hmm. people you know again Americans are decent people. They want to they want to believe they want to participate. They want to give. They're just a little bit jaded about it. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to almost reintroduce them to mm -hmm. what community can achieve right. if we stay inside by side. Right. So this is really interesting in terms of thinking about 
you know, Americans are, are good and they want to be helpful. And so obviously you have this great perspective, you know, both in DC and now in LA. I'd like to talk a little bit about what it means to have kind of communities of individuals who are willing to give a little bit of time and a little bit of money when asked versus the work that we do for kind of systemic change to shift the conversation in terms of where individuals need to help. So, you know, for example, the we're having this conversation, you know, less than a week since Hurricane Harvey hits Houston. And it's been beautiful to see this outpouring of people showing up with boats and wanting to send food and all these things. But that on some level, there's a fair amount of policy around urban planning and development, around kind of who lives where and, right. and how we fund those things, um, regulation around floodplains and, and all of this stuff. And even climate change. And, and well, still even, you know. That's a whole other, a yeah. whole other conversation. Yeah. But it is this thing where, like, at the end of the day, the outpouring of individual charity and generosity is, is beautiful. But there are things that we as a community can be doing in how we ask our elected officials to shape policy so that the need to have that individual outpouring right. changes. Right. And so in your kind of specific niche and thinking about both hunger issues, but I think also the ways in which um, society kind of views, whether it's men and women coming out of the carceral state or men and women kind of coming out of the foster care system, how do we hold these two things together in wanting people to feel connected to the work that we do, that you do, so that they will give, whether it's, you know, the check they write, the hours they give, but also educate them and be about the work of changing systems that will actually, like, get to root cause of why we're doing this work in the first place. Well, you know, if you think about it, for centuries, oil was just black, sticky stuff mm -hmm. until they invented the combustion engine. Mm -hmm. Uranium was mm -hmm. just a rock until they invented you know, nuclear. But these ideas of that energy was there, mm -hmm. you know, and it wasn't until they figured out how to tap into it um, that it was revealed, let's put it this way. Right. So my thing is, if you look at the community, mm -hmm. what is revealed through Harvey, or just people give $300 billion a year to charity. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the average, the, the biggest donors to charity aren't rich people. It's right. people who make $50,000 or right. less. That's who gives. Now, of course, a lot of it goes to churches, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. that's who gives. And you think about 70 million people volunteer every year. There is huge economic, social, political capital there that has been redirected for decades now into this charity thing. Right. So you stop and think, there is tremendous opportunity here. Mm -hmm. How do you get people to go from this to charity, which seems benign, and it's rooted in faith traditions. All faith mm -hmm. traditions share the sense of our obligation to one another. How do you move it in this new direction? Not exclusively, but how do you start to get people to see that? This is where I think we go back to the original nonprofit question we talked about change and people's fear of it. Because of the way nonprofits are funded, we're kind of in this nonprofit hunger games. Mm -hmm. We're afraid to challenge our donors for fear that they will move to someplace else that's mm -hmm. selling a cheaper, easier, high fructose corn syrup charity, right. you know? Now, for example, I would love to talk to more people about the idea of A, senior poverty. Mm -hmm. and senior hunger, because I think it's a profound issue. But just take it even further, all hunger's wrong, period. Right. So when you start to say childhood hunger, or even senior hunger, you're basically forcing people to see either or. Mm -hmm. um, and that starts to begin the process, unintended as it might be, of giving people an excuse to focus on one thing versus the larger issue. Mm -hmm. And I think the nonprofit sector, the only way we raise, raise money is my cause is more deserving or pitiful than yours. Right. And so we sell pity versus right. change. Right. So there's one thing. But I go back, we were talking at a class earlier about the power of nonprofits, either our collective purchasing power, mm -hmm. our banking power, but also the purchasing power of the 70 million people who volunteer for us. Right. And this idea of why don't we have a seal of approval, nonprofit seal that says every time you spend your money at this, you decrease the need for me. Mm -hmm. You know, why don't imagine if we if we you know, instead of saying give us some money at the end of the year, say we'd love a check at the end of the year, but the way you spend your money every day determines the need for us mm -hmm. or the fact that we might go away someday. So mm -hmm. think, ponder that idea of where you spend your money. Right. So if I'm a mayor of a small town, my number one thing is like, you got to spend all your money local. I mean, God bless the Walton family at Walmart, but every time you shop up there, somebody's got to run a food bank to supply food to the workers right. that aren't going to make it through the end of the month unless they got two or three jobs. Right. You know, so we have two choices. I can either tax you and we can have charity spaghetti dinners for the food bank, mm -hmm. or we can think collectively about how we spend our money 
really try and keep every dime in the local community we can. But it's trying to get our volunteers and the millions of people who clearly care and are committed to their community to see another way to build community besides charity. And that might take the ultimate courage of nonprofits saying, in effect, I'd rather you see this larger picture than continue giving me money. Mm -hmm. And that's a, you know, it's that, it's that large question. I've always said one of my great challenges, it's almost my own little mind game, is that if somebody came to me and said, Robert, I've got a plan that I think could end poverty and hunger, but it involves you closing, mm -hmm. you know, like tomorrow. Would I look for every excuse to say your idea sucks, or would I be like, mm -hmm. I am so intensely curious and I'm ready? Yeah. And it might mean I'd have to go out and completely find a new way for myself to make a living. Mm -hmm. I have to remind myself that that's what I've told homeless people and prisoners my entire career. You've got to find a new way to make a living. It's legal and it's going to keep you on the right path. Right. The nonprofits have told poor people to change for decades and no one's challenged us to change. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that mirror I like to hold up. Would I be willing or would I look for every excuse? So it's keeping true that promise that it's like, you know, I truly would. I think, you know, make that effort. I'm 59 now. Would I really want to go out and figure out what am I going to do now for a living if I don't be poor? Well, I could always 10 bar again, quite honestly. There you go. I'd probably be quite happy. Well, so I'm curious about, like, one of the things that I find really interesting is thinking about kind of the way that nonprofits approach funding. Um, and, you know, this idea, of, like, you know, early on when you're talking about the D.C. Central Kitchen and that there were contracts from, you know, HUD and the Labor Department and thinking about taking that money, but then in taking it, um, it would kind of force you into kind of taking too many people over capacity. I think I think the word mediocrity was thrown in there. Um, and one of the things that really stuck with me is this idea that nonprofits need to think about having a diversified portfolio. And so obviously, you know, I think in what you're doing with LA Kitchen now, what you're doing with DC Central Kitchen previously, and having both kind of the way that money is coming in from donors, but also kind of the for-profit piece that's able to sustain right. the work. And so over the kind of course of your tenure in nonprofit, what is kind of the, you know, not that there's any silver bullet, but when you think about an ideal kind of way to diversify funding sources, what should nonprofits be thinking about and kind of how to think and how to just process what a healthy funding scheme looks like? Well, let's let's focus first and foremost on why I do this, you mm -hmm. know, because sure, I like earning our own money. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. And I love creating jobs and giving right. people jobs that other people might not employ. Yep. But I alluded to it earlier, I believe the future of philanthropy is the way you spend your money every day. That the mm -hmm. only way to solve problems is for capitalism 2.0, right. which is a consumer-driven economy in which consumers realize that the way they spend their money, we're in charge. Mm -hmm. The illusion of power keeps us thinking, it doesn't matter, it's just a hamburger, a, you know, it's just a boat, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And that's cynicism. And the reality is, no dudes, the way you spend your money, I mean, Gandhi did it, Chavez did it, Dr. King did it, they all used the boycott to show that if the poorest people in the community don't participate, power stops right. and suddenly says, what do you want? You know, right. That is a fascinating thing. So I'm fascinated by what I call the boycott. Instead of the boycott, which punishes behavior, tries to coerce behavior, I'm interested in the boycott, this idea of can we reward? So for me, the idea of making money or social enterprise, it even non-profit with a for-profit, sure allows me to be less dependent on the fickle nature of philanthropy. Right. And it allows me to create jobs. It allows me to speak truth to power, but it says to people who buy our product, I am just one of many businesses. I am one of many social enterprises. Imagine if you thought as much about the catering gig you might have had that where you hired us, mm -hmm. or the wedding. Imagine if you looked at everyday commerce. Why not when you buy a car? Mm -hmm. Or not, why not when you buy a house? Why can't you get the same goods and services of capitalism, but all the value adds that we provide? So mm -hmm. that was part of my gig with the LA Kitchen, was saying to city government, right now you're feeding your seniors. You have a city contract. And right now the current contractor and no disrespect, they're a fine company, but they're a big multinational company, and they serve processed food, mm -hmm. made it a lower wage, and profit leaves town and never comes back. Mm -hmm. I'm just offering a business that will support local agriculture, keep people out of prison, provide good wages. I actually want to do this, mm -hmm. um, and profit will never leave town. I'll just reinvest it in the nonprofit side of what we do. Now, in theory, that's a pretty darn good meal, um, good deal for mm -hmm. a, a mayor. The goal is to say, imagine if Mayors of Colossus America saw that specific model and said, wow, that's cool that they do that with the Department of Aging contract, but we have more than just one contract. We have probably a thousand contracts. What happens right. if we said to the nonprofit sector in this town, hey, how many of you all would like to potentially evolve to get more contracts 
And what can we do to help you evolve? If it means keeping the money local and getting all these value adds, we as government might have a vested interest in helping the number of non Not every nonprofit can do social business, nor right. should they. Right. But for the ones that want to, imagine mayors saying, hey, this social enterprise is a really cool deal. What is it going to take me to get a whole bunch of nonprofits? Maybe it's going over to that university mm -hmm. where there's a whole business school full of young people who want to learn business, but they want to run a business themselves right. that does social good. How about if I partner with them and, hey, this town's full of an older generation of people who ran business. Mm -hmm. Maybe they could mentor younger people, and together we could start launching more and more of these social businesses and the power of our government contracts. And that might open the door even wider for a whole army of citizens to say, wow, well, shoot, we should be buying more of our money from the local restaurants mm -hmm. you know, and the local businesses. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is a consumer revolution. That is the great next leap. Mm -hmm. And I think, for, for me, social enterprise is less about my own organization's solvency as it is I feel like we are once again that Trojan horse that mm -hmm. that song in the nightclub mm -hmm. that gets somebody to say wow that song is so beautiful I wonder if that composer wrote anything else you know what I mean yeah and so to, to me it's it's a beautiful siren song of I, you know I always call social enterprise like economic Buddhism you know, it's this middle path between dot-com and dot-org. It's this new, right. beautiful thing. Right. And so, to me, as a real social entrepreneur, I'm selling less what I do as much as I'm one of many. And you should really look at this idea as a liberating force. Right. Well, so I'm curious, to go back to your own personal trajectory, obviously, you know, kind of being from the D.C. area and really kind of D.C. as, like, its own formative experience and, you know, having your start be with the D.C. Central Kitchen, what was it like to move all the way across the country and basically kind of start fresh in a new place that was not kind of as much a part of kind of your story as DC? Well, I'd be lying if I said there was an ego involved, you know, that I wanted to... There was a part of me that, at, again, we talked over. I had spent 25 years telling poor people, don't be afraid of change. Mm -hmm. So who would I be if I didn't say, after 25 years, maybe it's time for me to roll? Mm -hmm. I spent 25 years talking to nonprofits about leadership, mm -hmm. and I thought, what better example than than a, a, somebody who stops and says, you know what, peace out. Mm -hmm. You know, there's money in the bank, there's a solid business model, it's a great board. What would it be like? I could be an example myself. Not that anybody should follow my, but just that idea of a leader who splits. How mm -hmm. rare that is. So there's mm -hmm. a part of that. Now, of course, I also wanted to go out, and I saw an issue that I felt needed a showman's flair. And, and the credibility I might, my bona fides might bring and that mm -hmm. issue of senior poverty that no one wants to talk about. Mm -hmm. It's like that is probably one of the toughest nuts. But it's like, you know, I've got the resources. Right. You know, why don't I take a run at it? Right. I knew I'd grown up in Southern California, so there was an element of return. Mm -hmm. But it's also supply and demand, mm -hmm. one of the largest concentration of older people, and an epic supply of beautiful fruits and vegetables. The Central Valley of California is probably the biggest pharmacy mm -hmm. in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. So, and, and more importantly, as much as I'm interested in getting people to see the issue of senior poverty and a new way, a new social enterprise model for feeding those people mm -hmm. and employing people, I'm interested in redefining aging, this mm -hmm. idea of how do you get a society to see its elders not as somebody who needs charity, mm -hmm. but as, as, again, necessary to keep fully engaged in civic life, keeping them voting, active, productive, joyful. Mm -hmm. citizens, you know, versus just their old tick, 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 when are they going to die? Yeah. You know, so L.A. is the epicenter of the, the beauty myth in America. It's where everything is beautiful. And this idea of saying, look, you're beautiful just the way you are. Don't let anybody tell you mm -hmm. that because you have wrinkles or you have sunspots or mm -hmm. your hair is gray that you aren't just beautiful. In fact, silly as it sounds, I remember watching the movie The Notebook with my daughter. And besides weeping like a child at the end. But it was funny to watch the two alleys. Mm -hmm. There was the young vivacious alley, mm -hmm. and then there was the old Alzheimer's alley. And to think mm -hmm. that this young person is in there. Mm -hmm. And it made me really start thinking about older people, and just thinking that every old person I think I see was a young, beautiful, dynamic person out right. there who paved, who did things that we right. might not ever know. The small ripple that they put forth in this big ocean of life. And that sense of, of trying to see past mm -hmm. the bruises and the blemishes, that fascinates me. Mm -hmm. So whether it's like so much of our conversation has been, whether it was my nightclub, the kitchens, the work I do, it's always trying to get people to see through my work there's something bigger. It's almost like 
the magician who puts the, um, the, the handkerchief over the thing and then pulls out the rabbit. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to pull people in to, back to my nightclub, the theater of what right. I do. Right. Um, and it is theater because I'm trying to get them to see the magic trick, if you will, of voila, it's community. Right. You know? Well, so I'm curious, you know, when you wrote Begging for Change, it was published in 2004, and you kind of identify some, some different things that really kind of stood out to you in getting DC Central Kitchen up and running. Now, 13 years later, do you feel like the primary issues facing nonprofits have changed much in the last 13 years? Or if you were sitting down to write a second book, do you feel like it would actually probably be pretty similar in terms of what you identify as the main hurdles to nonprofits being either viewed differently or being more effective. <laughs> if, I, if I wrote another book, it would be titled, I fucking told you this was going to happen. <laughs> um, it's, like, it's like, how many times do you need to hear this? No, it is funny because I do, I mean, I've learned so much mm -hmm. since then. Mm -hmm. And I wrote that book and I was a frustrated young yeah. man, you know, and I've learned a lot about human nature and all that stuff since. But still, I mean, I talked about this issue of aging. Back then, I said, in fact, look, 2006, stroke of midnight, 70 million people are going to start turning 60, and every day, 10,000, and we got to prepare. Mm -hmm. Nothing. You know, the nonprofit sector has to view itself differently. And I spent 10 years of my life, and in fact, next week, I go back to New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And right after I wrote Begging for Change, I went to India. Because mm -hmm. I wrote, there's a little thing in that book that said the British never had more than 2,000 officers stationed on the ground in India. Two or 3,000, but a handful. Yeah. So as a kid, writing that book, I was like, wow, how did they do that? How did, how did basically a couple thousand white dudes dominate 350 million people on an entire subcontinent for 150 years? Mm -hmm. So off I went. I needed a break anyway after writing that book and, and running the United Way and all the other yeah. things I'd done. And I went to India thinking there was some big diabolical hunger, I mean, you know, uh, you know some kind of wild formula, you know, yeah. Da Vinci Code, you know, yeah. that... that uh, and it was divide and conquer. It, it took me 24 hours after landing in India and going to Nehru's home which is kind of a study center, this idea of, oh, they kept Indians divided by race, class, geography, language, and fighting each other. And it's like, oh my God, I wrote an entire book blaming the players, and it's the game. And mm -hmm. I literally ran to a payphone in, in New Delhi and was trying to call <laughs> Harper Collins saying, stop the presses, <laughs> Wait, I, I need it. 10 pages. Um, but it's funny because I came back and started the Nonprofit Congress and was the co-convener of this first Congress that brought people, Indian National Congress, Nonprofit Congress, same right. idea. Right. And the idea was, wow, you know, there's going to be an election, first election in 80 some years with no incumbent in the race. Maybe if we stood together, we could get these incumbent candidates to see us cynically as a voting block that they right. should court. Right. But hopefully, as a dynamic part, an unseen dynamic part of the American economy. So I went to New Hampshire, mm -hmm. and I spent a year and a half with a video camera much like yours. Mm -hmm. And it was back when you would videotape somebody. And I would run in and I'd upload it to YouTube, mm -hmm. and then I'd download it and I'd put it on Twitter and mm -hmm. Facebook. It was all new right. in 2007, 2008. Um, but anyway, I'm going back to New Hampshire to once again, literally 10 years later, to talk mm -hmm. about the same thing I talked about then, which was imagine our power if we stood together. Not every single day, mm -hmm. but the Chamber of Commerce model, that somebody comes into town and wants to regulate business in a way that will affect Right. Your abilities, you stand together and, and fight for, advocate for. Right. And we've never figured that out. So these are things that I touched on mm -hmm. in my book. But what's interesting now is there's new opportunities that might not have existed then. Mm -hmm. Back then I talked a little bit about the idea of service and how many young people were doing service. And the idea of kind of campus kitchens was why do we tell a whole university of students you've been raised doing service drive, leave campus, and go down to the food bank or the pantry or the domestic violence shelter downtown and volunteer versus there's a cafeteria here on campus, why don't we open up something there and open a doorway right here? Right. I could not have anticipated the millennials and the way they behave, and also 2008 and the fact that suddenly there's not a lot of career opportunities, not as many as there might have been. Right. And so you've got a, this latent energy of 100 million young people who are raised doing service who are, you mm -hmm. know, they're, they're frustrated. I, you know, you look at things like the Occupy movement mm -hmm. and helping a younger generation to say, you know, in fact, dudes, why occupy the street? Take over the town. Right. Elect people. You know, use your voting power. Um, as much as I warned people about the seniors coming, I didn't, I don't think saw them necessarily as such a, a potential huge political ally. Mm -hmm. You know, as much as I talk about 10,000 people a day turning 70, 
as an issue to be addressed and thought about. But now I see them as 10,000 people a day who might be looking in the mirror saying, how did I get so lost? Right. And, and how do I find my way back, not to Woodstock or the 60s, right. but to that sense I felt when I was younger. The first time I heard, you know, John Lennon right. or, you know, Santana or The Doors right. or, you know, Sly Stone. Mm -hmm. You know, how can I feel like I want to tribe up again and be part of something bigger? And, you know, is there a chance to create an intergenerational bridge between younger and older voters around things like food mm -hmm. uh, that might create a unifying principle? So, to a certain extent, the nonprofit sector is still, sadly, still mired in the, in, in the way it thinks, the subservient mode, the way we're funded. Very little has changed. There is more access to capital than there was, was and there's obviously a new generation of philanthropists, and obviously right. things like groups, you know, crowdsourcing right, right. things, um, the political opportunity of Twitter that I'm mm -hmm. mesmerized by. Mm -hmm. But still, the tools are there, but we haven't really picked them up. So, I feel like you know, we're still a little bit like primitives, you know. Mm -hmm. The flint and the rock is there, we just haven't learned to create the fire yet, you know. Mm -hmm. And we're all freezing to death. Right. Um, and I feel like, you know, one of the simians who's maybe suggested that there's fire there, but there's more of me than there was, let's put it that way. And that's one thing I really find inspiring. Mm -hmm. When I wrote that book, as much as I was frustrated, I was shocked how many people I met who said, in fact, you said what I've been thinking. Mm -hmm. I'm just like you, you know, mm -hmm. and there's an army of us, and there's even more now. Mm -hmm. um, I do think sometimes we look to leadership within the sector for change, and I just don't think it's going to come from there. I think the key, I'd say this over and over, it's mayors. Mm -hmm. It's electing a new generation of mayors at the smallest town's level who says, what do we have to lose? Mm -hmm. You know, there's that giant university over there, there's a town full of people who want to work. I mean, mm -hmm. all the tools are here, but I think yeah. that. That to me is the linchpin. It's not us seeing ourselves differently, it's mayors seeing us differently and challenging us mm -hmm. to live up to our true potential. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been a joy. And for the conversation. And honestly, I'm, I, I'm always available. If you want to reach out, I am regger at lakitchen.org. I'm happy to talk anytime you want. Great, thank you. Thank you.